All right, Islamic influence and the fall of Ghana. So right now what you may do is organize this, either write down vertical notes like this where you just put the title and make dashes, or make it into Cornell notes. And you may get that ready. I'll give you just a moment. And the first thing I'm going to bring up is, it says Islamic influence in the fall of Ghana. Don't think that Islam's influence caused the fall of Ghana. It didn't. There's no connection between Islam, the religion coming in, and Ghana falling. Those two aren't connected. A uh, real quick example I'll just give you. Sometimes people make these mistakes all the time. They make false connections or false cause and effect. Uh, I'll give you an example. In the like 1920s, 1930s, somewhere around then, polio was a huge problem. It was a disease that could cause you to become handicapped, lose the ability of your legs, arms, even die. So polio becomes this huge disease, and a lot of kids were getting it. And some people saw that, oh, you know, wait a minute. Ice cream sales go up at the exact same time that polio has been going up. So they made the connection that there must be something in the ice cream causing the disease polio. So for years, parents wouldn't let their kids eat ice cream or wouldn't buy ice cream. Ice cream sales went way down because it was seen to cause this disease polio. And what they found later on is that polio is not caused by ice cream. It spreads more in warmer weather. When people are outside around each other more and in warm weather it spread. What also increases during warm weather? Ice cream. Ice cream sales. So they both at the same time, but they don't cause each other. There's no connection to them. Sometimes we can think, oh, this happened, this happened. They must be the same thing. Does it always exist that way? Okay. So Islam becoming the uh, religion of Ghana had nothing to do with its fall. All right. Well, let's talk about how Islam comes in, and then we're also going to talk about how Ghana falls. So Islam comes into Ghana, and we covered this last chapter a little bit, so if you have that down pretty well, just take a few notes. Basically what happens is cultural diffusion happens. You trade with people. You don't just trade goods. Ideas get traded. Religion gets traded. This happened on the Silk Road. This is how Buddhism and Islam spread on the Silk Road as well. So what happens is the Muslim traders come in from North Africa and Arabia, and along with bringing salt, other products, into West Africa, well, they come with their books, they come with their Qurans, they come with their other books, and they are the people in the world right now, along with the Chinese, who are doing a lot of reading and writing. And because of that, and because Islam was very organized, these governments, very structured, would it make sense that you'd want these people to help advise you in your government? They read, they write, they're very organized. Is that kind of what you need for record keeping? Yeah. So a lot of people in the Ghana Empire, they start having advisors who are Muslims. And if you're around people a lot, you start talking, you start trading ideas and things. And eventually what happens is many of the people in the nobility in Ghana convert to Islam, and eventually the kingdoms. And the king of Ghana, around 1050, the ballpark figure, so around 1050, um, <clears throat> the people, the king of Ghana converts to Islam. And because the king is so powerful, when he converts, most other people, a lot of other people convert as well. Now, in the capital of Kumbi Salah, where there was the king, you would see a lot of people converting to Islam, but they also kept a lot of their native beliefs. So they kind of make it a cultural diffusion mix of Islam with native beliefs. It's an Islam that's uniquely West African. So that's how Islam comes in. And the next two empires we read about are going to be Islamic empires from the start. So we see Islam's influence outlast the empire of Ghana. But now let's talk about the other topic, how Ghana actually falls. So <clears throat> Ghana falls from pressure from the outside and pressure from the inside. Both pressure from the outside and pressure from the inside. <clears throat> the pressure from the outside came from some groups who were living outside the empire, for starters. 
You had people who were not part of the Ghana Empire, but they see there's this king who's got old as gold. He's rich. They want to become rich. They want to have access to gold. So we find that there are mines that were found outside of Ghana's kingdom. And it's hard for Ghana to keep expanding and taking over and more. It takes a lot of resources to do that, a lot of military. And what happens is Ghana kind of spreads out to try to take those. But at the same time, people on the inside of Ghana, it's hard for the king to like keep control of the gold monopoly. He eventually loses it. Between these people finding new mines, and also people on the inside of Ghana kind of smuggling, also trading gold without consent of the king. You have some nobles who, are, who see weakness in the kingdom and who are able to start selling gold directly to the North Africans and the Arabs who are coming in. So what happens is you get a person here kind of selling, a person over here kind of selling, and it's kind of like, it's almost like a game of whack-a-mole where you try to hit that mole and his head keeps popping up. The king just can't control everything anymore. Is this pretty common in empires when they rise and fall? You see corruption of nobles. That starts happening. And then there's this, there's a drought that happens over many years. There's not as many farm. There's not as, farming isn't as good. So people, when they're not farming, there's not food, do they want to get money on the side? They're more likely to sell gold without telling the king. Add to that, there's this legend that we don't know if it's true. We just don't know if it's true or not. What happens is, in Ghana, the Alamoravids come in. Again, we don't know if this is true or not. But they come in to take over Ghana. So they come in to take over Ghana, and there's, it's written down in a lot of Arab sources that they came in, they took the kingdom over. But there's not enough historical evidence to prove that. So we don't have the historical evidence to prove that this takeover actually happened. So it's possible they came in and they defeated the king when he was weak. Now is that a possibility with everything going on with you know, the king losing power? If you're an outside trader, and like we said in the last slide, you only trade with people when you can't take from them. Was well, it possible this group's like, hey, wait a minute, this might be the the time to come in and defeat them and find those gold mines. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Ghana breaks apart and Ghana basically becomes into what happens when empires die is it becomes a period of war in states. Nobles take power <coughs> and the empire falls. Now it's also possible that this invasion never happened that Ghana just literally couldn't hold everything together and it crumbled from within. And it's also possible that these nobles just started selling gold and they got more and more power and the king couldn't keep them in line, couldn't stop them, just like what happened in China in the Zhou dynasty. And it's possible that it became a period of warring states and that the Alamoravids and other groups just came in and, oh, you're not going to sell me the gold? I don't like your price. I'm going to go talk to this guy. I'm going to go talk to this guy. I'm going to go talk to this guy. And that they could, like, you know, competition would do what's the gold prices? Bring it down. Bring it down. So. <clears throat> um, so Ghana falls. And later what happens is when Ghana falls, we have a period of warring states until the year 1235, which is when the Mali Empire will rise. We'll see a new dynasty rise. And I'm going to stop there.